Damos comienzo ahora rápidamente a, a la siguiente sesión. Invito a Ana Paula a mantenerse en el escenario porque seguirá en la siguiente sesión y al resto, pues muchísimas gracias. Y, y bueno, la siguiente sesión va a estar centrada, va a poner el foco en Estados Unidos y tendrá el formato de, de entrevista, donde tenemos el privilegio de contar con la moderación de, de nuestra presidenta, como he dicho, Ana Paula Márquez. Eh, me gustaría invitar a, a subir al escenario a Tom Terbus, presidente de EPRI International, que no habla español, por lo que voy a cambiar a, a inglés. Mr. Terbus, uh, it's a pleasure having you here in Madrid uh, for our event. Uh, please, when you can take the, yes, the, the seat by Ana, Ana Paula. We leave you in very good hands uh, with Ana uh, conducting the session. Thank you. Dear Tom, while they microphone you, it's, uh, it's a pleasure having you uh, with us. Many thanks for having accepted our invitation to travel to Madrid to, for this event. And uh, let me start by introducing you shortly to, to the audience. Uh, Tom Berbush works uh, at the Electric Power Research Institute. He serves as vice president of member and technical services and is also um, the president of Electric Power Research Institute International is accountable for the overall funding and collaborative engagement with members and partners, organizations in the United States and also over 45 other countries in support of EPRI's mission to drive innovation to ensure the public has safe, reliable, affordable and clean energy around the globe. Since joining EPRI in 1997, uh, Terbush has held a wide range of positions in Europe Asia and North America involving uh, economics, nuclear, power delivery, sales, uh, marketing and technology transfer. Prior to joining the Institute, he worked with US and Japanese organizations on energy economics, technology and deregulation. So for us, it's really a pleasure to have you here today. He has also a PhD in economics from George Mason University, where he developed uh, expertise in energy economics and energy regulation, energy markets, and economic performance. So I think we will have a very interesting session, and it's for me a pleasure to be here moderating. Um, so Tom, my first question to you is, uh, would you mind starting by explaining briefly uh, about uh, the mission of the organization you lead, uh, what you do, where and who you work with around the world, and the relationship you have with the World Energy Council? Sure. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to have me here. Obviously, I'm, blessing, I'm blushing after that uh, introduction because it's, it makes me sound much more important than I probably am. But let me talk about EPRI very quickly. We were founded over 50 years ago in Palo Alto, California in the United States with a mission as a nonprofit NGO with a mission to make electricity cleaner, more reliable, safer, more affordable. Over those 50 years, our mission has become much more global and electricity is refocused into energy. Reliable has kind of morphed into resiliency in, in addition to reliability. Affordable has morphed into equity, things more equitable, and clean has really morphed into sustainable and decarbonized. And we work with over a thousand energy companies, universities, research institutes, member governments, technology providers in more than 50 countries around the world, ultimately to identify the key challenges that the world is facing in energy short-term and long-term, we crowdsource the concepts for solutions, we crowdsource the funding that's necessary to get them done, we find the best people in the world to do the work, and then we work with all these companies and entities to basically de demonstrate and deploy the technologies. And our relationship with the World Energy Council, for many years we've been working with really the headquarters in London on studies, thought leadership, providing technical information to make sure that gets to everybody, and a couple of years ago we took over leadership of the US chapter. And as part of that, we're really making a concerted effort to reach out to the other chapters like the Spanish chapter, the Spanish committee, to see how we can support, see how we can share knowledge, to see how we can help what's going on in Spain and, and likewise learn from Spain in the United States. Thank you. Uh, Tom, we are in a, it was mentioned uh, in the beginning of the introduction also by Mario, we are in a crucial year for the climate change international negotiations with COP28 taking place a few weeks now uh, in Dubai. 
Uh, last September in New York, New York uh, nearly 200 countries met at the United Nations uh, Climate Change uh, Summit to really assess how we were on track uh, to meeting the promise that we made under, under the Paris Agreement uh, as part of the process that is now called the Global Stockade. Uh, this assessment should now guide countries uh, to set new, more ambitious uh, climate policies and finding for uh, clean energy to get closer to the objective that we have of the 1.5 um, degrees uh, goal. So how do you see the global uh, CO2 challenges from the point of view of the American energy transformation? And uh, what are your key energy and climate goals and the type of difficulties that you are finding to reach them and how compatible they are with the other dimension of the energy trilemma that was already discussed here today that it's affordability and security of supply. Wow, well, okay, that's a lot to answer in three minutes or whatever I have, <laughs> but uh, let's talk about, obviously we all agree that the, the challenge of this transformation is immense. It almost feels impossible, but we know we have to do it no matter what. Uh, you know, obviously carbon emissions have been rising. I think globally we've seen a 40%, 50% increase in the last uh, 30 years. Uh, Europe and North America are a little different. We've actually hit inflection points and we're coming down. So if you look at this chart here, it's not unlike Europe. I think Europe is probably doing better than the US, but we hit an inflection point, you know, say 15 years ago where we've seen carbon emissions going down but they're not nearly fast enough. And if you look at the goal for the United States from the Paris agreements, uh, we're supposed to reduce carbon emission CO2 to 50 by 50 or 52% by 2030. Nowhere near on track to do that. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the recent you know, uh, legislation, incentives that come from the US government that certainly are getting us closer, but we're not quite there, but we do have a long way to go. Challenge wise, you know, we, you know, if you look at obviously Environmental sustainability is what this is all about, and it's bigger than carbon. But if you look at energy security, um, you know, we're going from a fuel-rich energy system historically, which had energy security implications, whether it was oil and gas, Russian gas in the case of Europe. The U.S. has become increasingly energy independent, but now we're moving to a system that's mineral-rich. There's all these critical minerals out there that at the current time, maybe there's only one or two countries that are actually sourcing these materials, processing materials. If we learned anything from the pandemic, it's a supply chain that relies on one country thousands of miles away from you. It's probably not a sustainable strategy. And while we in Europe and North America and everywhere else in the world are ambitiously trying to get more minerals, get more manufacturing in line so we can put up more renewables, more transmission lines, everything else we have to do, we're all gonna be fighting over the same supply chain. So we have to figure out how to expand these supply chains, interlink them and really and make that work. So that's gonna be critical for energy security. And then really the third leg of the trilemma, which is really affordability and equity. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I mean, that is, that's almost, that's a, that's a deal killer if we don't get that right, because the whole thing could stop. Tom, I think it's interesting. You've mentioned uh, the US and, and Europe. It's been now a year since the IRA uh, and also since the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, they are providing uh, multi-billion dollar incentives to decarbonize industry and, and to develop manufacturing of low carbon technologies. Um, and some might argue that that was a wake up call for the EU green in industry policy, industrial policy. Um, could, could you explain a bit to us your perspective on, on the two acts and in particular, what are the initial results that, that you are seeing regarding its implementation? Sure, yeah, well, we'll start, uh, if you go back to 2021, late 2021, the infrastructure legislation was passed, which really doled out a lot of money for infrastructure, and over 100 billion of that was a $1.2 trillion infrastructure package for the United States. Over 100 billion of that was earmarked for clean energy, for decarbonized technologies, uh, hydrogen, electric vehicles, transmission build out new technologies, um, and they had a large cost share to it, but that, that had an impact, but it paled in comparison to what came next. And there was a CHIPS Act, which we didn't mention, that also had, that's a $350 billion thing to really onshore uh, semiconductor manufacturing. That had $50 billion of decarbonized component to it as well. But what came immediately after that, the IRA, just it, everything else pales in comparison. So, I mean, this was a very, very large thing. On paper, it only had $359 billion worth of projected incentives, so it was a different approach. IRA and CHIPS were more grants, investment, 
this one, the, Infl and the Inflation Reduction Act, it was incentives, tax credits to try and incentivize private investment in clean energy. And it's actually, so far, I mean, it's early, it's only a year in, but it's been, it, you know, the preliminary signs are not only that successful, it's successful beyond our wildest dreams. The uptake in the incentives right now is projected to be triple what we thought it was, which is great if you care about sustainability and clean energy, not so good if you're trying to you know, balance the government accounts when you thought you were gonna spend this and now you're gonna spend over 10 years three times that. We're sorting that out, but that has really motivated a lot of investment. So these are in all areas of clean energy. So it's clean power production, not just renewables, but also nuclear. It's in clean molecules, it's in hydrogen, carbon capture, it covers electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and clean, uh, you know, uh, uh, fuels for flight, for, for airplanes, things like that. If you look at really the, the overall impact, we've gotten, we projected $1.2 trillion worth of incentive uptake over 10 years, but the investment that's stimulating, we're projecting about $3 trillion worth of clean energy investment over the next 10 years, and which we'll go into a lot more, and you see some of these announcements, well over a trillion dollars worth of announcements just in the last year and a half. Uh, some of those are semiconductors, but most of that is electric vehicle, clean energy, a lot of renewables, transmission lines, and this is all based, this is the additional investments being made to take advantage of those tax credits. Um, do you believe, Tom, that um, the IRA is putting the U.S. closer to meeting the Paris Agreement, its Paris Agreement objectives? What's your perspective on that? Well, I would say that uh, we are, it's definitely making it closer. I mean, if you looked at that chart earlier and the projection, I'm gonna go back to this, but if you looked at the chart earlier where the curve, we bent the curve, uh, much like uh, you have in Europe, but the trajectory is not nearly what it needs to be. We need to double, really triple the, the reductions over the next 10 years. So it has gotten better. You see, if you look at the components of it, whether it's electric vehicles or renewables installations, um, heat pumps in homes for home heating, IRA has helped a lot it hasn't quite gotten us to where we need to be. I mean, if you look at this chart, if you look at the projections out before the IRA, where your kind of base case is, EPRI does a lot of analysis. We have a lot of economists in one little group that do a lot of like general economic analysis uh, in North America and other regions, and we saw really that the trajectory we were on was not good. Nowhere close to the Paris Agreement. IRA gets us much closer, probably a 40% reduction based of 2005, still doesn't get us all the way there. We'll see how that plays out. Just to get that 40% reduction is challenging. We're gonna need more to get to the 50%. And EPRI doesn't really advocate for policy, so I'm not gonna say what that policy is gonna be, need to be, but it's gonna need to be more. So. And, and do you think it will help the IRA, it will help uh, reinforce US as a key global climate negotiator? I think in the short term, absolutely. Uh, right, so that the U.S. is making major investments in clean energy. Uh, I mean, the U.S., if you historically, it's the largest carbon emitter in the history of the world. So the U.S. needs to take a leadership role in investing and bending this curb. I think in the short term, it gives the U.S. government probably a lot of um, status to try to, to be at that table and try to, you know, this is a global challenge. We've got to work together globally. On the long term, obviously, if we don't hit the 50 or 52%, that reduces our ability to, to be an honest you know, partner in this. Um, I mentioned in the, in the beginning the importance of uh, collaboration between, between governments uh, and also between the public and the private sector um, as being key to really overcome the type of challenges that we'll face ahead. Um, in particular, uh, I really believe that transatlantic uh, alliances will be fundamental in closing to the risking uh, strategies from some other countries that, that are not in the both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, what do you think are the main opportunities uh, for collaboration um, between, uh, between the two sides and uh, in what particular areas do you see this collaboration? Well, I think we already do a lot of collaboration, but I think there's an opportunity to do a lot more. So I would say there's at least two areas. One is just sharing and work collaborating together on technology development, sharing best practice, regulatory approaches. I mean, our regulators are overwhelmed with all these things that they have to do immediately and, and how are they gonna do it? And Europe is doing that in the US. We have 50 different sets of regulators with 50 different states. They all need to learn from each other. Europe needs to learn from the US. We need to learn from Europe and then we need to share that knowledge, share our people, share our learning, share the technology development. I think the second thing is sort of related, which 
we need to, I think, integrate our supply chains more than ever. We're already fairly integrated, but we need to really think through, we've got all this money, all these incentives to transform our energy economies over the next seven to 10 years. So the money's gonna be there, there's gonna be a lot going on if we don't figure out how to reduce whatever barriers are, real or perceived, in working together, it's gonna make it that much tougher. Um, you mentioned uh, the barriers that you are seeing. What, what do you believe that we are not doing enough to, to really overcome those barriers? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not a trade expert, so I'm not gonna delve too far into that, but I would say, you know, obviously at the beginning, the Inflation Reduction Act had some made in America provisions, which were probably counterproductive for integrating our supply chain. So that sort of thinking is, neat. and obviously the US administration is walking that back a lot. They need to keep walking it back, but we need to make sure we avoid those sorts of missteps and figure out how to work together. Um, we normally talk about climate change, security, and other challenges at uh, institutional, political, technology, and regulatory levels. Uh, and maybe we are not putting enough attention uh, in the people dimension, which is also key in, in this energy transition. And we talked about this yesterday at dinner, like all the challenges that, that we are facing. How do you see also, not only in uh, EPRI, but also in WEC, these social aspects? What particular actions uh, do you believe that could be implemented that have the necessary impact in the society that we need to bring along with us? Yeah, no, that's important. I, I would say there's at least three things. One, education, and we need to work together on educating not just energy consumers, but really the workforce, the leaders, the experts of the future. We need more experts and more leaders than we need today, than we have today, to really to envision the system for the future. So really it's education, bringing people along. I think the second thing is we need to turn, in English we would say, turn consumers into prosumers. We need to make sure that end users, energy consumers, aren't just passive, they're actually providing, they're contributing to the solutions that we face today. If you look at, certainly I'm more familiar with the US, but we also see this in other places where we have outages or near misses on capacity margin, where you know the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing and load's going up for some reason and we've got a two megawatt shortfall and everyone's freaking out trying to solve that problem. We've relied on different tools, you know, rolling brownouts, ind industry doing demand response, we need to really pr generate, provide the tools and the programs and incentives so that every person can use their building as a resource for the grid. So we ultimately have grid flex flexibility. It's gonna save us a lot of money. We'll have to build a lot less supply if we can rely on end users to provide part of the solution. That will save us trillions of dollars globally. And then I'd say lastly, it's about affordability and equity. I mean, we cannot afford to leave anybody behind if we don't figure out how to make, you know, we've done some studies in the US where we show that we can make the transition affordable, uh, even with horrible prices on supply chain, extraction of minerals, all this, we can do it if you look at the full energy wallet. If you look at what a person spends or a household spends on energy between electricity, natural gas, uh, fuel for their vehicle, and all these other expenses, we can probably make that, we can probably make it affordable but not if we do silly things on incentives and taxation versus uh, electricity rates. So we gotta think through how to make the change acceptable from a pocketbook perspective. I mean, I don't know about Europe, but certainly in the United States, if the energy transition proves expensive, it could kill the energy transition. It could set us back decades, and we just can't afford that. And you know, just stepping back, I and mean, we all have a stake in this. I mean, I think we all know the challenge is immense. We're probably all, if we're really thinking through, we're very afraid of what we have to do over the next seven years and we're questioning whether it's possible, but we know, and deep down in our bones, I think if you're here, you know we can do this. Society has done crazier things in the past. We can come together and make this transition happen, and make it affordable, but not if we don't do it together. And that's not just Europe and North America, that's every person in this room, every consumer, every company, we gotta make sure we work together. So I challenge all of us to just let's work together, let's find new opportunities, let's educate, let's get out there. Um, Tom, just uh, one, one final question for you. You have, you've mentioned that it's a collective responsibility. Um, you see both sides of the Atlantic, uh, not just where you are 
uh, located, but also all the collaboration you have with the different countries and the different chapters that you work with. Um, you have here present both uh, presential and also in remote, many people from the sector, from the private, from the public sector. Um, what do you believe is a final message that you would like to convey to the sector as a whole and to all the people interacting in the ecosystem regarding the challenges that we face ahead? Yeah, well, I mean, I basically, we do have to work together. We can do this. We have to help each other. You know, it's not regulators versus private companies versus member governments. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, if you're a regulator, that's the worst job in the world right now to try to figure out how to integrate all this. It's thankless. And so we have to, if you're not a regulator, if you're a pri you know, private company, energy company, we have to figure out how to help the regulators do their job, how to help do our jobs, how to work together. Because we can't end up pointing fingers at each other. We have to actually just reach across, assume that the person across the aisle from you wants to work with you and, and do that. And that goes whether it's an ocean or a political aisle or a regulatory private construct. And we know it's crazy, but we just, we just, we have to be talking to one another. We have to be aligning our goals and just doing it. So thank you very much, Tom. It was uh, very interesting, everything that you have discussed with our, here with us today, and also some of the charts uh, and the slides that you've presented with us. I'm afraid that we will have to finish the session, but I am sure that we will have plenty more of opportunities to collaborate between uh, the different institutions that we have here and also between the Electric Power Research Institute and the US WEC uh, in the near future. And once again, many thanks, Tom, for coming and sharing with the audience all your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you much. so much.